The book of Revelation predicts that someday the mark of the beast will be enforced by law around the world. Get ready for the details on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. The title of this power-packed message is called The Mark of the Beast Enforced. My goal is to share information with you and what you do with that information, that is up to you. Uh, I don't know if you've watched my past presentations, but we've gone into detail about the beast and about the mark of the beast in other programs of His Voice today. And if you've missed those programs because they have really built up and laid the foundation for what we're going to do today, if you've missed those programs, I encourage you to uh, go to youtube.com forward slash whitehorse media and catch up. But anyway, here we go. Uh, it's time to talk about the enforcement of the mark of the beast. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, the Bible predicts, and he causes all. Cause implies force. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, first of all, uh, I'll just quickly recap what we've talked about in the past about who the beast is in Bible prophecy. If you were to go back to the 1500s and talk to the Protestant reformers, uh, they were unanimous on who the beast is. I've got in my library and here in my hand a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs. This is an ancient uh, classic dealing with the Christian martyrs and the persecutions and the Inquisition. And on page 43 of this book, it tells us who the Protestants believed that the beast was. Per, uh, page 43 says, disregarding the maxims and, and the spirit of the gospel, the papal church, arming herself with the power of the sword, persecuted the church of God and wasted it for several centuries, a period most appropriately termed in history, the Dark Ages. And then it says that the kings of the earth gave their power and their strength to the beast. So this is Fox's Book of Martyrs. It used to be uh, next to the bedsides of the Puritans and the pilgrims who came across the Atlantic from, uh, from England and from Holland coming to establish colonies to help establish America. This book was a classic and they read it and they knew. They knew who the beast was. Now, the Bible also says that the beast will have a mark. It'll have a mark that will be enforced. And I mentioned this in the last program. This is a copy of a Roman Catholic catechism by Pierre Geierman, published in 1946, and it comes right out openly, and it says, question, what day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? The answer is because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So here's Fox's Book of Martyrs, identifying the beast, which is really a system. It's not individuals. It's a system uh, called the Roman Church, which has done a lot of things in history that fulfills prophecy, and that's what the Protestants believed. And here's the Roman Church's catechism that says that they change the Sabbath into Sunday, and they actually see Sunday observance as a mark of their authority as the true church. Now, I know that's shocking, but these are historical facts. And when we go back to Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 12, we have a warning about the mark of the beast. And at the end of verse 11, we have a warning about those who receive the mark. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so here are the Ten Commandments. Here's one of the tables of stone. And Revelation talks about the beast and that it would have a mark. And then in verse 12, it says to avoid the mark is to be among the people, the saints, who keep God's commandments and the faith of Jesus. And verse 7 in the same chapter says that we need to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And the fact is, when you look at the Ten Commandments, there's only one commandment that talks about the creator of heaven and earth, one of the big ten, and it's number four, 
which identifies the seventh day Sabbath as God's special day. And that is the commandment that the Roman Church, which Protestants have believed for a long time is the beast of prophecy, has changed. And they claim it is a mark of their authority in religious matters. Now, if all of this is true, if this information is correct, and, and I don't expect you to take my word for it for anything, and I'm not here to condemn anybody, but to share information. And you can do with it whatever you choose. But if this is all true, that the beast is the Roman church, and that its mark is its change of God's holy day into the first day of the week, then when the Bible says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark, we can expect that at some point in history, and during the final crisis, that Sunday observance will be enforced by law around the world. Now, is this possible? Is this uh, just some crazy idea? Or is it something that can actually really happen uh, in America and around the world? Well, let's discuss this. It is a fact of history that uh, Sunday has been legislated for hundreds of years uh, in the past. The first Sunday law was passed in the year 321 by the, uh, the emperor of Rome, Constantine, uh, on March, if I got the date right, March 21, 321 AD. It's a historical uh, event. It's in the history books. And that was uh, basically the first time that Sunday had ever been enforced by legislation. If you go down European history, if you go into British history, and into colonial American history, uh, you'll find that Sunday has been enforced in various degrees. Uh, those laws used to be called blue laws. I've got a book right here called Dateline Sunday USA, written by an attorney, Warren Johns, and the subtitle says this is, this is the story of three and a half centuries of Sunday law battles in America. And this talks about the court records and the struggles between whether Sunday should be enforced by law, whether this was constitutional or not. It talks about the Blair uh, Sunday bill that was introduced into Congress in the year 1888 seeking national Sunday legislation and how it was defeated. The facts of history are here. Did you know that George Washington uh, was almost thrown in jail because he kissed his wife on a Sunday? Uh, the blue laws were very strict back in the days of early, early colonial America but they've been loosened now, and so now we don't have those kind of laws. But there are, there are many, there are forces, there are churches, there are organizations that are very active at this very moment that would like to see those old blue laws kick back in so that Sunday could be once again legislated by law. Here I have a copy of the large official catechism of the Roman Church published in 1994. This is their big book of their doctrines. And on page 538, this book comes out very, very clearly in support of Sunday legislation. They believe in it. They encourage uh, their members to seek it. Here, page, actually, I'm sorry, it's 528. It says that public authorities should ensure citizens a time intended for rest and divine worship. Christians should seek recognition of Sundays as legal holidays. So the church, the Catholic Church has gone on record of wanting this. Uh, many popes have gone on record wanting this. There's a whole organization, an alliance in Europe called the uh, European Sunday Alliance that is seeking for leg Sunday legislation. But at this point, it's never happened on a national or especially not on a global scale. Uh, is something like this actually possible? Let me share with you some very volatile and serious information. Let's go back a few years to the day that the towers came down, September 11, 2001. I remember where I was when that time hit. I was in Texas. Uh, my phone rang. It was a friend of mine, and he said, Steve, you've got to turn on your TV. And I did, and I was shocked to see one of the twin towers burning right in front of my eyes on live television. And then I was shocked to see another plane hit the second tower, and then the second tower was burning. And then I saw the first tower go down, and then I saw the second tower go down. And along with millions of Americans and people around the world, I watched those images over and over again. And I had uh, a very strong sense that something big was happening, that something apocalyptic was going on, and that I needed to really sit up and, and take notice. And of course, uh, pray for the families 
of the victims, which I did. Now, let me tie this in with prophecy. Uh, I strongly believe that there's a, a deep lesson for us in the significance of what happened during the week of 911. If you recall, the date, September 11, 2001, took place on a Tuesday. On a Tuesday, don't forget that. Three days later, there was a big church service in Washington, D.C., in the National Cathedral. And it was a church service where lots of different uh, politicians, congressmen, senators, presidents, they were all there. Uh, anyone who really was anybody in America, as far as Washington leadership, they were at that, at that church service. And it was really a, it was a prayer meeting. Uh, Billy Graham was there representing the Protestant world. There was a rabbi there representing the Jewish world. There was an imam representing uh, the Muslim world. There was a cardinal representing the Roman Catholic Church. And one by one, these different leaders gave speeches and they encouraged people to come together uh, into unity and to pray because the crisis was very real. When you hit the financial center of the most powerful political nation in the world, the potential for a ripple effect to affect the global, global economy was very, very real. And so on the Friday following the Tuesday of 911, people came together from different religions to pray. And I'm certainly not against praying in a crisis. Uh, we, need to, we need to pray now and, and all the time, especially in the days, of, days ahead. But anyway, that was on Friday. So you had crisis Tuesday, a move for unity on Friday. What happened two days later? Two days later was a Sunday. And I want to tell you that the following, the, on the Sunday following September 11, church attendance went through the roof. Not just in America, but Europe, Australia, around the world, people were going to church like they had never gone to church before. And what is the reason for that? The reason is simple. Like I said, uh, when you hit the financial nerve center of the world's largest and most powerful uh, economy, the potential for a disastrous ripple effect to bring down the economies of, uh, the, economies of the world is very, very real. And so, uh, and people were scared. People were scared. They knew something serious was going on. Trading stopped on the uh, New York Stock Exchange and people were just in a state of panic. What is going on? What's going to happen? Now, again, think of the sequence. Tuesday was a crisis. Friday was a move for unity. And then Sunday, church attendance went through the roof. So here's the sequence. Crisis, unity, Sunday. Crisis, unity, Sunday. Now, uh, thankfully, what happened over 10 years ago during the week and following weeks after September 11 uh, did not continue to unravel into a real desperate global crisis. It didn't happen. I think that the angels held back uh, the forces of darkness, held back the forces of total chaos. God is still holding on to his world uh, somehow but it didn't really completely unravel, and so the crisis uh, eventually went away, and the stock exchange went back, and there has been a somewhat of a recovery. But the Bible predicts that someday in the future, we are going to hit a crisis that we're not going to get out of. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says that there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. What is going to uh, precipitate that crisis, what would be the catalyst of that crisis, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it might be another terrorist attack, whether it might be a whole series of uh, natural disasters, whether it might be some kind of, uh, of an economic meltdown. Uh, I just don't know. I'm not a prophet, but I do know, according to the Bible, that we are going to enter in at some point, and it's going to happen very quickly when it finally hits, into the final crisis at the end of the history of this world. The Mark of the Beast is perhaps one of the most misunderstood mysteries of the Bible, but it need not be. Speaker Steve Wahlberg explains The Mark of the Beast in his eye-opening series titled Mark of the Beast Mysteries. Mark of the Beast Mysteries is a four-part DVD series for only $19.95. To order your set today, call 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-782-4253. You can also order this series on our website, www.whitehorsemedia.com. And when that crisis hits, I can guarantee you, you can, you can bet your bottom dollar, and you may not have a lot of money, 
Uh, but you can, you get my point. You can bet your bottom dollar that what happened during the week of September 11, 2001 will happen again. And it's just because of human nature. Have you ever heard the expression, uh, many people have said there's no atheists in foxholes. It's, it's true. When people come face to face with crisis, with death, with disaster, uh, they, they often drop to their knees, or at least they open their mouths, and they pray. And then they go to church, which is what most people do when they're in a crisis, or at least a lot of people. And so think about human nature. What happened during the week of September 11 will happen again. All we need is a big enough crisis to bring about the same sequence of events. There'll be a crisis, then there'll be a move toward unity, coming together of the world's religions uh, combined with governments, a move for unity, and that will be followed, I can guarantee you, it, it will be followed by people flocking to church, not on Saturday uh, and not on, not, not on Friday, but the majority of the world are going to be going to church on Sunday because that is the biggest day on the planet for worship. It, it really is. So we're going to see again, crisis, unity, Sunday. And if the crisis doesn't uh, resolve itself like it did so many years ago, if the crisis deepens, if it gets worse, if people get desperate, then what's going to happen is Sunday attendance will eventually shift to the next, the next phase. And the next phase will be Sunday legislation in an hour of desperation to try to force in a final crisis to force humanity to come back to God and to pray to God for the survival of the planet and of the economy and of the world's systems. That's what's going to happen. It's what, that is what is going to happen. As I mentioned, the Roman Church, they are pushing for Sunday legislation. In Europe, the European Sunday Alliance is pushing for Sunday legislation. And when we hit a crisis and people are going to church, but the crisis gets worse, then we're going to see laws that are going to kick in as a last-ditch effort to try to solve the problem, to force people to pray. When that time comes, when that time comes, and you, you may not believe right now that that time is going to come. Uh, I don't know when you're watching this. You might be watching this in the middle of the crisis and it may be happening right now. If it is, then you, you know this, this message is right on target. Uh, if you are watching before it happens and if you're not sure whether this is really going to happen, just you know, ponder all of this in your heart and study your Bibles to see what's right, what's really right. I strongly believe I'm honest about this belief. I've studied my, Bibles for, my Bible for years and years and years. I've looked at the theories. I know what other people say. I've, I've seen some of the movies about the Mark of the Beast, the novels, the internet websites, the radio preachers, the TV preachers that say that the whole thing is just really a, a technology issue, a technology issue. But that's not what I read in my Bible. Let's go back to Revelation 14, verse 9. Revelation 14, 9 says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worships the beast, and the beast is who the Protestants used to believe it was. They've lost this knowledge, but that knowledge needs to be resurrected. And I certainly am not saying that every single person within the Church of Rome is, uh, is beastly. You know, that's just not true at all. I believe there's going to be a lot of sincere Roman Catholics that are going to be in the kingdom of God. I believe that because God is a loving God and a merciful God and He judges us based upon the light that we have. But it is a fact of history that for 300 years, Protestant scholars from Luther to Wesley to Calvin to Jerome to Spurgeon to Huss, uh, they all believed that the beast was a symbol of the Roman church system. And the Bible warns, if anyone worships the beast, and his image and receives his mark. The mark comes from Rome. It's a, it's a mark of Rome's authority. In the forehead, which does not represent the skin or an implant, it represents the mind, inside the mind, what people think. 
or the hand, which represents the actions, what people choose to do. The same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God. It's a very serious warning. And then verse 11 continues on with the warning, what will happen to those that get the mark. And at the end of verse 11, it talks about uh, what will happen to whoever receives the mark of his name. And then verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The third angel's message points to the safety zone. During the mark of the beast crisis, the Bible says, the Bible says that the safety zone is becoming a saint. It's becoming a person who chooses to keep the commandments of God as God gave them. And the faith, it says, the faith of Jesus. Jesus is mentioned in, it's the last word in verse 12, and then there's the period. Jesus. Now, some people say, we don't need the law because we, we just have Jesus. But the Bible says that we need to be followers of Jesus, and because we love Jesus and believe in Jesus and accept his grace and his salvation through his power, we're born again, and then we choose to keep the commandments of God. We don't keep God's law in order to be saved. We keep God's law because we have Jesus in our hearts, and we love him, and we want to do what's right. And that's what the Bible says. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So these are the issues that the book of Revelation reveals. And what's going to happen is once the crisis hits, the final crisis, and there's a move toward unity, and then uh, people are going to church on Sunday, and the crisis deepens, and finally Sunday attendance, attendance shifts into Sunday legislation. At that time, the message of the third angel is going to go out around the world with a loud voice through ministries like White Horse Media and through many other ministries that are going to be faithful to God, doing the best they can, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're going to be giving God's last message to the world. And then as the Ten Commandments are lifted up, just like I'm trying to do right now, the Ten Commandments will be lifted up, people will have a chance all around the world to look at the Big Ten to go down one, two, three, four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And they'll be told two things. They'll be told that uh, Sunday legislation is wrong because number one, it's the wrong day, and number two, it's, it involves force. God never forces uh, people to love him or to follow him or to obey him. Uh, he always gives us free will to make a choice as the Holy Spirit speaks to our conscience. So. The world will have to make a final choice. The Ten Commandments will be lifted up. And as God's law is lifted up and people realize what they really say, what, this, what the real day is, the seventh-day Sabbath that points to Jesus Christ as the creator of heaven and earth, then they're going to realize that they are commandment breakers and that they need a Savior. And those that are honest, those that are seeking truth and who want to be on God's side, they're going to be hungering, hungering for the cross of Calvary. And so the commandments of God will be lifted up and the faith of Jesus will be lifted up and God's people around the world will lift Jesus up higher and higher and higher and people will have a chance to, to look at the one who died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And they will realize that Jesus died because we have broken God's law. That's why he died. Sin is breaking the commandments, including the fourth. And Jesus agonized, he suffered, and he died on a cruel cross 2,000 years ago for your sins and for my sins where we've broken the law. That's why his heart was broken on Calvary. And then, hallelujah, he rose from the dead. And then the world will be brought to a final point of decision. Whose side will, will people be on? Will they choose the beast or will they choose God? Will they choose, choose tradition? Or will they choose truth? Will they choose the day that man has uh, changed and is now enforcing by law? Or will they choose the day that God has written with his own finger on two tables of stone that ultimately that day points to Jesus Christ himself as the maker of heaven and earth? These are the choices. That's what the Bible says. I'm not making this up. These verses are going to be read around the world and the Holy Spirit is going to be talking to people's hearts, just like the Spirit of God is talking to you. 
verse 11 says, don't get the mark of the beast. And verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And once everyone makes their final choice, people that choose to believe a lie, that choose to believe in Rome's authority and in the change of the Sabbath into Sunday, once they know the light and the truth from the Bible, if they choose to go along with it, they get the mark in their foreheads. Those that uh, know it's not right, they don't believe in force, they don't believe this is really something that's uh, from God, but they choose to do it anyway because, hey, they've got to They've got to feed their families, you know, they can't buy or sell unless they go along with the mark. They're going to get the mark in their hands. But God's going to have a people who to say, no way, you're not putting a mark in my forehead or my hand. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow the Bible. I'm going to follow truth. I'm going to follow the Ten Commandments no matter what. And then the doors of heaven will close and the plagues will fall on those that get the mark of the beast. Those that don't, God will protect all the way through to the day, the great day, when Jesus Christ comes again. And that will be our next, uh, our next meeting, is on Armageddon and the seven last plagues. Don't miss it. During the Civil War, a long time ago in the 1860s, somebody asked Abraham Lincoln, and he said, uh, Mr. Lincoln, do you believe that God is on our side in this crisis over slavery? And Abraham Lincoln is said to have responded. He said, I'm not so concerned whether uh, God is on our side or not. My biggest concern is, are we on His side? And that's God's concern as well. Are you on his side? Am I on his side? What are we going to do? Again, the Bible says, not the voice of Steve Wahlberg, it's not from uh, one particular church, it's God's word. Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. May God help us to be among this people. You have just heard his voice today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg.